welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I'll serve as your host today. Uh, today's webinar is part of the Energize Your Journey webinar series that we're doing in conjunction with the Association for Manufacturing Excellence. Uh, this series is highlighting us uh, several of the presenters uh, that you can meet at the annual AME conference that takes place October 26th through the 30th. Uh, and stay tuned because AME is actually exploring several options, uh, among which is the possibility of a virtual conference. So please do stay tuned for uh, some announcements about that soon. Uh, and stay tuned at the for the end of our webinar. Uh, I'll be sharing a special discount code that provides a $500 discount off the registration fee uh, when you register. Just a couple points of logistics before we get started. Uh, today's short presentation is being recorded. Uh, you'll receive an email uh, within an hour after the webinar ends with a link to the recording. And please do share this with others in your organization. And then due to the short nature of our webinar, uh, we are not planning on fielding questions. If you do have questions, uh, please direct those to our presenter. Um, and Eric, uh, I'm not sure if you share your email address uh, at the end, but if not, I can remind you and perhaps we can share your email address with the audience. Sure, it so, is on the last slide. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So with that said, let me introduce uh, our presenter, Eric Kulikowski. Uh, Eric is the owner of Dare to Be Amazing and is dedicated to excellence, building on employee engagement, cultural significance, and change leadership. He has served as a senior operations leader for Philips Home Healthcare, where he helped develop a world-class operation. In fact, uh, it was two of the company's Pennsylvania plants that were recognized by Industry Week and Assembly Magazine for excellent performance. Uh, Eric is also a professional member of the National Speakers Association. So Eric, it's a real pleasure to have met you this way and uh, look forward to your presentation. So I'll go ahead and turn things over to you. All right, well, thanks, Dwayne. Good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending on uh, where you're at, maybe even good evening, depending where you're at. And, you know, today we're gonna be talking about accountability. And, you know, I certainly uh, recognize that this, this one word has become a, a very mainstream, commonplace word that's talked about in our country today in the United States, given, given the social unrest that we uh, have been experiencing. Um, for a long time and more specifically the way it's been brought to the forefront in the last two weeks. And uh, so accountability more than ever is something that people are gonna be talking about. And it's something that we have recognized for many, many years in leadership that is very, very important, but uh, it's also an important social aspect. And so um, you know, we're not gonna get political today, but I just wanted to recognize that accountability is something that has, uh, has been right on, the, right on the tip of our tongues here recently and and you know accountability is one of those things that's very hard when you say the word accountability it, it can draw on a whole bunch of different emotions or definitions but there's one thing that I know for sure and and that is that um, uh, being a being a leader is, is easy it's like riding a bike except the bike's on fire you're on fire everything's on fire and you're in hell so I don't know if you've ever had a day like that or in fact, every day of yours is like that. But uh, you know, accountability and, and working with people to manage accountability can somewhat be that way. And sometimes it can look like this, you know, what fits into your busy schedule better, exercising an hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? You tell me, how do you want your behaviors to reflect the performance that you're gonna get? And, and I know this really well because I own a, I own a fitness uh, facility here in Pittsburgh called Rising Six. And, and we see these kinds of behaviors all the time. And whether it's fitness or whether it's leadership, focusing on our behaviors first is really the important step into managing accountability, to developing alignment, to creating those relationships with our employees and with our suppliers and our customers and our leaders that is really most important. So you're gonna see this theme quite often today that when we focus on behaviors first, results are gonna come afterwards and uh, something I truly, truly believe in. And so when we focus on behaviors more than results, um, you, you get better results because you can't predict results, but you can impact behaviors. 
And that's our goal today is to find some unique ways to impact behaviors by using this thing called accountability and putting that in a more stronger way into our leadership toolbox. And uh, so we'll share a few pieces of chin beard wisdom as, as we go through today. And so let's take a look at what the def dictionary definition of accountability is. And it's an obligation or willingness to accept responsibility or to account for one's actions. So it's a, it's, you know, that creating this obligation or willingness, I commit to whatever, right? Fill in the blank. And that you're accepting responsibility for your actions and or the actions of others. So in essence, it's not what we talk about. It's what we tolerate. Many organizations have a really strong, powerful set of core values and value statements. It's not what we talk about, it's what we tolerate. What are those behaviors that we tolerate? What are the behaviors in ourselves that we force others to tolerate? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. My easy definition of accountability is do what you say you're gonna do. You tell me you're gonna do something, go do it. You commit to do something, go do it. I ask you to do something and you agree, go do it, right? That's what accountability is. It doesn't have to be any more fancy than that. There's, the longest word in this statement is five letters. Simple, folks. Do what you say you're going to do. But there's also a corollary to this, which is when there are no consequences, there are no rules. When there isn't the, the understanding and the agreement that if follow through isn't done properly, if actions aren't aren't taken in the way they're supposed to, or behaviors aren't executed in the way they were committed to, there can be consequences, business consequences, personal consequences, safety consequences, life and death consequences from a quality perspective if you're a medical device company. So where there are no consequences, there are no rules. And I wanna tell you about one of the first times in my life that this ever came to the forefront. And um, it was in uh, 1985, I had just graduated from from the University of Dayton with a mechanical and aerospace engineering degree. And I was just about ready to move to Sunnyvale, California to go be a rocket scientist working for Lockheed Missiles in Space, developing rocket motors. And my sister was about to give me her car. And this picture you see here is, is the car she gave me or a reasonable facsimile thereof. And um, we stood in the driveway of my parents' house at 5252 Curry Road in Pittsburgh, and she dangled the keys in front of me and said, Eric, this car is yours, except if I ever see or hear about you not wearing your seatbelt. Do we have an agreement that you will always wear your seatbelt when you drive? Not this car, just this car, but any car going forward, but specifically right now, this car. I said, Yes, Nancy, we have that agreement. And I've never driven without my seatbelt on since. That was 35 years ago. Nancy and I had alignment on what the goal was for me to wear my seatbelt and be safe. I was accountable to my sister to do that, right? I was responsible to wear my seatbelt. I was accountable to my sister, Nancy. And you know, research shows us that 90% of of executives really believe that they need a, a strong accountability structure in their organization. But candidly, I don't know what the other 10% are thinking is gonna get them there, but 90% do. But only 25% admit that they actually do it well or their leaders are proficient at it. And what happens when you don't have a strong culture of accountability is it creates a really significant dependence on the leaders because you as leaders always have to be there to mop up a situation or to chase somebody to get something done or to deal with a circumstance that was outside of your expectations. So highly aligned and highly accountable teams outperform those um, who kind of lack both of those, alignment and accountability. And when we take a look at our worlds, especially in our worlds, if you're in a technology company or in a service business or a manufacturing company, everything we do has three primary elements, people, process, and technology. It takes all three, there's no doubt about it. But what I'm here to talk to you about today is that when we focus on the people element of this more than we have in the past, about our relationships, about accountability, about alignment, being clear with our objectives and expectations, 
when we focus on people, the results are so much higher and your job becomes so much easier. And I don't say this from an academic standpoint, I say it from an experiential standpoint, that my time as a, as a middle manager and a senior leader inside of Respironics, when I believed this triangle that is on the screen and I began to live my life and develop my, my team to be able to be this way as well, my life, my leadership life and my personal life got so much simpler to the point where my wife even told me she noticed a difference. My really good friend, Robin Benincasa, in her book, How Winning Works, she says, the power of the human connection is sometimes boundless, heartbreakingly beautiful, and beyond measure. And so what it tells us from Robin's statement is that relationships are really important in the world of accountability. We follow those that we trust. We follow those that we believe. We follow those that have values that match ours. So relationships important. Alignment and being clear with our expectations and our goals is really, really important. And then that leads into accountability. We have relationships, we have alignment. Bam, we got accountability now because people are willing to accept to do hard things in a bold way if they have a relationship with you and they're aligned with you. And that's what drives their behaviors. So when we talk about alignment, what are we really talking about? Well, how do we do that? We anchor it. We anchor it with our vision, our mission, our values, our standards, our incentives. All these things, folks, are non-negotiables in an organization. When I become an employee of your company, it's not up for debate, discussion, or negotiation what set of values I'm going to hold myself to. There's one. There's yours. And I accept that. And I align to those. And those uh, values create a line of sight for everybody. We're, we're creating this common language that we talk about, that if the customer always comes first or the employee comes first, or if we always ask what we can do before we ask what somebody could else could do for us, that creates the language. It also helps us define what does winning look like. Alignment, when people are aligned and understand they can be a higher performing employee. And if you take nothing away from this time together today, this next piece, I want you to put on a sticky note and put on your computer monitor. Every employee, if they are truly aligned to you and to the, the goals of the organization should be able to answer these three questions. What is it that we do? How do we do it? And how do I fit in? What's my role, right? What am I supposed to be doing? What is it that we do? How do we do it? And how do I fit in? Every employee should know how to answer this question, at least at a, a you know, somewhat um, superficial and somewhat detailed level, right? So let's, let's take a look at this piece of wisdom, which says failure can have more to do with the lack of alignment than the strength of vision or efficiency of execution, because your employees need to be able to answer these questions. Alignment is so critical in this subject matter of accountability and in this leadership practice of accountability. Alignment has to come first. People need to know what is it that we do, how do we do it, and how do I fit in? Make sense? All right, so let's take a look at the next piece here. So we've talked about alignment. Now we're gonna talk about accountability. We've built some relationships with our folks. We've defined and driven and discussed and commiserated on alignment. Now, how do we go after accountability and behaviors? Well, one of the myths I, I like to talk about with accountability is that uh, account being accountable, you only hold people accountable when things go wrong. Why did you do that? I wanna break that myth and tell you that you're supposed to establish the accountability at the time of commitment, right? Whenever there's an agreement that something is gonna be done, you're gonna talk about what are the consequences if this doesn't get done and so on. You're gonna talk about the what, what's gonna happen, who's gonna do it, when's it gonna get done by, what's the result gonna look like, and what help maybe do people need in being able to stay on track with whatever you've asked them to do in order for them to stay accountable to you. Because here's the thing, we are responsible for things or actions. 
we are accountable to people. Responsible and action or uh, and accountable aren't the same thing. Accountability is to people. Responsibility is to actions and outcomes. We need both, but we shouldn't use them synonymously. Another myth is that if I didn't say it, I didn't commit to it, right? Well, you can also say if you didn't object to it, you did commit to it. So that's why we want to talk about what the commitment is and maybe even, in fact, get the people or other person to mirror that commitment back to you. We also don't want to fall into the trap that we don't need to talk about what needs to get done because everybody knows what's expected of them. Everybody knows what winning looks like, what good and bad looks like. And I'm here to tell you that, no, they don't. In fact, most people are going to run away from doing more and having to be held to task. It's someone else's job to hold me accountable. Well, no, it doesn't. Accountability starts with ourselves. That's probably a nice meme we could find on Facebook or Instagram, but it's true. Accountability starts with us. And the last thing about accountability, the last myth I want to talk about is that training is sufficient for new behaviors. Training is not. Training is not a, an appropriate corrective action to define and drive new behaviors. Training is merely a methodology of transferring knowledge. Rarely in training do we talk about how do we then transfer that knowledge into the expected behaviors and the accountabilities that come along with it. So we can't say that training is, is a corrective action, right? It just isn't. And it's, it's certainly, put yourself in the scenario of someone who has been asked to do something. It's impossible to feel accountable when you're confused and don't understand how things work. We need to bring people in and let them be part of those conversations. So when we take a look at accountability, what are the enablers of accountability? And I always like showing definitions, as you saw earlier. An enabler is a person or a thing that makes something possible. So what makes accountability possible? Because it's hard. And it's an easy thing for us to want to shy away from because it's hard. And sometimes it can lead to challenging conversations. We're either on the receiving end or the giving end. So let's take a look at the five C's of accountability. The first one is common purpose. This is where that alignment comes from. We, we want to connect to that. Why are we doing this? Why am I why am I asking the organization to do this? Why am I asking you to do this? Why am I asking you to stop doing this? What's the purpose? What's the motivation? What's the driver behind it? And we want to define clear expectations for people. One of the greatest um, derailers of accountability and alignment is, is that there's just a lack of clarity. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I can't answer those three questions of what is it that we do, how do we do it, and how I fit in. So clear expectation starts with answering those three questions. Communication is very important. We have to be comfortable in, in talking to our folks about um, what we, what our expectations are, what behaviors we're looking for, what are those desired behaviors, and what are the consequences if we don't perform that way, either the company, the customer, or to that individual. And we're going to do this in a collaborative way, right? We'll make adjustments along the way as needed. And lastly, we've talked about this a couple of times. We want to make consequences and the results visible. We should show when the when the graph is going in the wrong direction. And if we're if the graph is 25% off from the target, we shouldn't say we just missed it or we're just a bit off. No, you're not. You're really far off. Be candid. Talk about the consequences and what are the behaviors of bringing us back? And how can we help each other make that happen? And so what are some mindsets and practices that can help us in the accountability side? One of them is, is this phrase here, live with a relentless pursuit of better, right? And Dwayne with Lean Frontiers, this, is, this could be a rallying cry of, of what you all do as well. You're, you're pursuing that, that you know, relentless state of better. You're relentlessly pursuing better. And so I want to show you two examples here that I, I very simply – uh, have put into this uh, fitness gym that I own. And the first one is a, is a set of uh, kettlebells. And they used to just be stored when I bought the business. They were stored just randomly. You had to look at each kettlebell to figure out what weight that kettlebell was. 
Well, I used a little 5S on the kettlebells, and now they're in lanes. They're 70-pound kettlebells, 62 pounds, 53 pounds, whatever, as we go through, right? Easily, you can find your kettlebells. Relentless pursuit of better. The, the second picture you see is the barbells. Um, as much as I tried, I couldn't get people to put the barbells back in the slots I wanted them to, to have all the 45-pound barbells together, the 35s and the 15s. So I drew lines on the rack, and I marked what the weight was for each one of the locations. A relentless pursuit of better. These are simple. And from day one of having done this, there has not been a barbell or a kettlebell out of place ever. It can be simple. The second mindset we have here, too, is, to, is a two-way conversation. Accountability is not about you just telling somebody else what you need them to do and how you need them to do it. It's a two-way conversation because commitment can only be made by the other people, or the other person, or the other people. So I encourage you to have a two-way conversation you know, with your direct staff. Have one-on-one -on -one meetings on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. Don't wait for that annual performance appraisal to have it the only time that you talk about behaviors and performance. And lastly, get a commitment, get that pinky swear from them that what they, what you are asking them to do and what they've nodded their head up and down about, have them verbalize the commitment. It might seem esoteric to get somebody to just verbalize, to play back, to mirror back to you what you need them to go do and how they're going to go do it. But in the neuroscience of our human brains, that's what is going to allow us to lock into and begin to have that personal accountability we need. So these are three behaviors that I'm asking you as leaders to pursue. Live with that relentless pursuit of better. Two-way conversations. Get that commitment because to change your results, you've got to change the behaviors of yourself and your team. And it's got to start with you. Absolutely has to start with you. And it's the, the single biggest thing that I work with my coaching clients on, my leadership and executive clients that I work with is, first, how do we have to look at your behaviors and how are your behaviors serving you well and how are they not serving you so well, right? And we want those behaviors to be inspired and motivated change, not forced. We can't just, you know, force our needs on people. We have to do it in a way where we've got those relationships, we've created alignment, now we can talk about accountability, and the results are going to come from that. But to change the behaviors of you and your team, there's a key aspect here, and this might take you a minute to think about when you see this next piece of uh, information. But see, here's the thing. Changes in thinking happen before changes in doing. I see it in business all the time. And I see it in my gym every single day, right? I can think, I can decide, you know, I can talk about and tolerate the fact that I need to lose weight. But I first have to start thinking about how am I going to do that? And I'm going to think about the rewards of, of losing weight. And I'm going to think about the consequences of not losing weight and come into a commitment with myself before I'm going to have any changes in doing. We got to think about it first. I'm going to jump out of that airplane before I jump out of that airplane. I'm going to make that left turn before I make that left turn. I'm going to show up for a meeting on time before I actually, or I'm going to think about showing up for a meeting on time before I actually show up for a meeting on time. Make sense? Can be a little exhausting as my boy Rudy shows here, but changes in thinking happen before changes in doing. And Dwayne, I want to I want to kind of close out our time here today with a story. Uh, from our gym that really made me think about how accountability starts with ourselves and not by being stoked from somebody else. And so in our gym one day, I was I happened to be the athlete that day and my, my partner was, was coaching the class. And one of the things we had to do was get down into a plank hold position, which is you're kind of in a push up, but you're on your elbows instead of your the palms of your hands. And the deal was state commit to how long you're going to hold a plank and then go do it. Well, I'd never held a plank more than 60 seconds. I'd only ever held a plank or I've never, yeah, I'd never held a plank for more than 60 seconds. So that day I said, I'm pushing myself. I'm going to hold a plank for 90 seconds. Nate said, three, two, one, go. I'm down to my plank. I'm holding it and I'm sweating and my arms are shaking. And I don't know how long into my 90 seconds I am, 
So I turn my head and look up at the wall to see the clock to where we're at. And all of a sudden, I feel this hand on the back of my head. And it turns my head so that I'm looking at the floor again. And it's Coach Nate. And he says, hey, Eric, that clock's not going to help you get to 90 seconds. Only you are going to help you get to 90 seconds. I had made the commitment to get to 90 seconds, and I had to go do it. And so Nate really gave me a good realization that day that accountability starts with me. He couldn't help me get there. That clock couldn't help me get there. I was the one who had to do it. It's not what we talk about. It's what we tolerate. If we tolerate less than needed behaviors, if we tolerate less than expected results, if we tolerate in ourselves those times where we don't say yes when we have the opportunity to be a better leader, right? We have no, no one to blame but ourselves. It's not what we talk about, folks. It's what we tolerate. And when we focus on behaviors first, the results are going to come. And I encourage you to be bold with defining the behaviors that you're looking for and to call out those inconsistent behaviors. Don't accept them and just say, well, that's just the way Dwayne is, right? But here's the thing. I'll leave you with one last piece of advice. No matter how the world is presenting itself to you, no matter what the challenges are that we're faced with, whether it's COVID-19, social unrest, it's 92 degrees today, a supplier missed a shipment, an employee called off work that day, customers are giving us too many orders and we can't keep up. There's one element, there's one constant in this world that will always be there, and that is that hair is highly overrated. My name's Eric Kulikowski, and I dare to be amazing every day. Dwayne, thanks so much for this opportunity, folks. I, I hope this, this brought a little bit of clarity to this idea about accountability. Here's my contact information. If I can be of any assistance, if you have any questions or there's a particular point you would like some more clarity on, I'm happy to help with that and, uh, and, and have a little bit of a conversation uh, with you. So, Dwayne, with that, I will hand it back over to you and, and thank you for the opportunity to share it today. Thank you.